So Dave DeRose is a major project biologist at the Okanagan Nation Alliance. Previously, Dave was an operations program coordinator at the Central Kootenai Invasive Species Society and also worked for Tech and BC Hydro. So he'll be uh, discussing a, a project in partnership with the Wildlife Conservation Canada Society Canada to improve roosting habitat for tree roosting bat species. And so if we, oh, is that correct, Dave? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I just wanted to see if you're seeing my screen at all. We are, we've got you. Oh, and, awesome. and for a reminder to folks that joined in, if you wanna go into your view button and do side-by-side -side speaker, uh, then you'll see the speaker. And uh, Dave, there'll be a chime going off in um, about 13 minutes to let you know you have 12 minutes left. Okay, I got my timer going here too. Okay, yeah, thanks everyone. Uh, I went through, looked at everyone who's on the line and know a lot of you after being around for a number of years. Um, yeah, I'm uh, so I work been working with Okanagan Nation Alliance for four years now. And we are out of, out of the Casagar office. There's three of us full time. Uh, there's five that are on call. And then I will pull in community members from the uh, the Okanagan communities. And just a little snippet of all the, the different projects that we do heavily into bears. Uh, I love my turtles, uh, spade foot. And then on the left is just some work with BC Hydro. Um, so very exciting, uh, lots of work going on. Um, we, I'll, I'll get to why we got involved with this project, but uh, near Beasley between Cassegar and Nelson, there's an old Vic Queen Victoria mine, which I think was a copper mine, just judging by the, the leachate that's around there. Um, and this is what we call the duck. That is uh, uh, the traditional territory of the Okanagan Nation people, including Colville Tribe of Nations, which is uh, uh, also uh, part of our organization. Um, so I was reading the paper one day and I know Corey a bit, have always wanted to work with Corey, it never happened. Uh, and then I saw this alarming article. Um, Dr. Corey Lawson has questions about logging in unusual bat habitat near Beasley. Uh, my past history has been with logging, salvage logging after fire in Northern Alberta. And being on a lot of the, uh, you know, the long-term logging planning committees. So uh, uh, I, I do, it, it triggered me. Uh, and if you see her comment, uh, this is the only location in Canada where we know the species hibernates. Um, and it uniquely moves between trees and the mine throughout the winter. So myself and others reached out to Corey. Corey reached out to everyone. This is an example of our conservation community working together. Marlene and Tanaha were involved with uh, a bit of the review of the, the logging plans. They've got a lot of expertise there. And so it, it all synergized into uh, um, a project where we were, sorry, uh, where we were trying to decide what to do in light of the logging that was going to occur, uh, how could we mitigate as best possible um, to help uh, these, there's several bat species in the area um, and, uh, and, and definitely old growth, steep, uh, big trees. I could see why they were in their logging. I mean, these were just massive trees. Um, but I'll just give you a little bit of, of, about the species. Um, uh, they're thought to migrate. Uh, they were thought to migrate uh, in the winter. However, they're found in southern BC uh, throughout the winter and on, on the coast. Um, these bats are dependent on snags, mature trees, uh, and little was known about winter and summer uses of these tree roosts. Um, these roosting requirements make them very sensitive to silviculture practices. If you think of a logger going in, uh, I mean, these, these bats are hard to see to begin with that they're not gonna know. Uh, and finally, there, there, there were two silver-haired bat hibernation sites that have been identified in the Pacific Northwest, one being at this Nelson Beasley site. So very important. And the fact that we just knew very little about it, and yet uh, 
you'll see later some of the blocks um, logging was going ahead uh, you know relatively uh, unhindered it was it was quite a, a number of discussions that we had with the logging company BC timber sales um, uh, not always good um, but uh, I think uh, I think jumping onto this project was a way to highlight this issue and maybe try and get them to think about things. Actually, we did a tour with them near the end and, uh, and you know, maybe there's a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe I'm being too optimistic, I'm not sure yet. Uh, and if no people don't know the site, uh, very unique. I actually hadn't been there before. It's within 20 minutes of my house, but um, um, yeah, and you can see some of the, uh, you know, the copper leachate coming down the bank. And this was Corey and others uh, put the uh, the grading in. I don't I don't have a lot of the history, but basically protect the site. Um, the assumption, especially from the forest company, was that well most of the bats are in the cave all winter hibernating, and it, it and it turns out well yes and no that they come out and especially last year we had such a mild winter that uh, um, there there was movement in and out. Um, so it'll be interesting that we're predicting, I think they were predicting a cold winter this year. So we'll see what happens this year. We have some more monitoring going on with, uh, with Emily, the master's researcher. Here's an example of the types of trees you'll see in the area on, on the left here. And if you see that bark uh, flaking off, leafing off, um, that's where they were found. And, and in fact, this is one of the trees that, uh, that they were in. And if you look on the right, you're going to see uh, cut block boundaries marked everywhere. So uh, it's definitely a challenge, not for just for this species, but we're dealing with it in the Okanagan. And I think the Okanagan, maybe because they've gone so far the wrong way to begin with, um, there's a lot of we're uh, in discussions with uh, the Forest Service on the salvage logging. And in fact, ONA was instrumental in getting a lot of the uh, the roads closed um, this fall after the fires so that we could limit uh, uh, our concerns were with the animals and uh, hunter access to those animals and just trying to give them a break. So that type of collaboration worked really well. Uh, I'm not sure that we're there in the in the West Kootenays yet, but uh, that's the goal is to go that route. <clears throat> and my screen just hides things here. So I'm gonna see if, uh, and, and here, is, uh, here are the partners. Emily is the master's candidate from um, University of Northern BC, Corey Lawson, Wildlife Conservation Society of Canada. FWCP was huge. Um, the three nations have uh, indigenous opportunities, uh, directed project dollars uh, that will come every year. Um, I split them with fisheries. And what it does and what, what it can do is that we can mobilize on a project like this really quickly because it was time sensitive. The logging was happening. And uh, we brought in some core dollars. Emily and her crew uh, and Corey brought in um, dollars from their project. So uh, we leverage, I think, $30,000, $35,000. And with Corey's funding, uh, it leveraged up to over $90,000 project. <clears throat> Uh, just for this year. And finally, uh, Columbia Basin Trust, um, just the mayor may not know that they were involved, but uh, it's within uh, one of the programs that <clears throat> Yvonne Patterson is, is doing on the lower Columbia system and, and Trail Wildlife Service. And so uh, we leveraged um, with them also, to, and they purchased actually this material, you're gonna see the artificial um, bark, which is the Brandon bark, uh, very expensive. Um, Talking to Corey about it, I don't think she's on the call, but uh, um, she suggested that we may need to do more of these types of habitat work um, where you emulate old growth characteristics in the lower Columbia Valley. So um, this is the start of it. Uh, we have one summer of monitoring. We've got lessons learned and we're looking forward to next year. Oops, come on. Oh, there we go. <clears throat> so here's the brand. You can see the Brandon bark below, and they're about a thousand dollars a sheet by the time you get it shipped. Uh, three by four, um, 
on the right is typically how they do it. They'll install it on a post lying down and put it up. You have a dried post uh, cured, uh, and there's I'm not sure if that's a real bat, but <laughs> going under the bark. And they can move around under that bark. They can go on the north side, south side. Um, the objective is to examine the microclimate of artificial bat roosting structures and determine their effectiveness as year-round habitat compensation in the event of loss of roosts. So we're looking at compensation, working with the forest companies. Um, uh, you know, it, um, the, the, the difference between this uh, structure that they're erecting, uh, we could not do that on a steep, rocky slope uh, in dense forests. So we decided to try, I'm not sure if that's my next slide. Oh, we'll start with the methods here. Um, so that's Emily on the right, uh, but we did some mist netting, uh, captured some bats, transmitters, and then she tracked them all summer and into the fall. And we'll do so this winter and is looking for those unique trees. And so she found some clusters and I may be jumping ahead, but that is, we, we did the artificial structures around those clusters that she already found. Uh, and here's what it looks like. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of equipment on these trees. Um, those are humidity and temperature sensors on the north side and south side. So we want to see how uh, those parameters compare to natural parameters under natural bark. Uh, Todd Manning was our wildlife guy. Um, this was new for him. Um, so what, what we did was strip those trees, I think uh, probably about nine or 10 feet of them. Live trees, you can see the girdling around the bottom to uh, kill them. Sometimes there's two girls. And I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but there's the artificial bark, put a cap on top. And then this tree would have been modified. Todd does he didn't do inoculations on this one, but he has done, you know, deep slits into the trees for day roosting sites, um, undercuts, and then working with Corey, they've come up with another technique that they're going to test over in the East Kootenays. So we have uh, the artificial bark and also the, the artificial manipulation of the wildlife trees. And if you look at these trees, they're pretty small. They're that's, that's what you're dealing with. These trees are not going to leaf off for another 50 or 60 years, so. And that's Carly down there. Uh, here's just an example. The, the highway to Nelson, Nelson is, is on the right, uh, Kassiger is on the left. Um, the mine itself, this is really steep slope. I, I don't envy Emily climbing up and down these slopes, but you'll see the orange is the summer roost trees that they've found. Um, and then the blue is the, uh, the winter roost trees that they found. So they're using this area quite extensively. Um, some of this we've now found out, I think down here is private land, which is for sale. So that also complicates the project. Uh, and then our Brandenburg sites, there was three of them, one, two, three. And within those sites, we'd have three Brandenburg trees and three Todd Manning uh, wildlife manipulated trees. So for a total of 18 trees in this one site, or in, in this one area. So some of the results, we had 20 bats with transmitters. Uh, Emily identified 13 winter and 21 summer roost sites. Uh, there's the Brandenburg numbers. We had we had guano traps underneath the Brandenburg. Uh, we, we, uh, I'm trying to think, oh, still got time here. Um, Two more minutes. Have, okay, one sample of guano that will get eDNA. Um, what we found we'll do in the future is that we will do the wildlife trees at this time of the year. Um, the trees were not fully cured by September. The ones more in the open by the mine site were, but we think uh, some sap protrusion may have limited the effectiveness. So we will do effectiveness, effectiveness monitoring in 2022, uh, and we're pretty sure those trees will be ready to go. Oops. And that's it, thank you.